Jetco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Coin Payments, crypto payments made easy. There's a lot of different pockets of tensions happening around the world. And of course, volatility and risk remain high. But what can investors do right now to hedge against all this risk? Joining me right now to talk about the crypto space and our macroeconomic picture is Irina Heaver, world-renowned crypto lawyer. Welcome back to the show. Pleasure to host you again here on Kitco. Thank you so much. It's uh, good to be back. When yeah. we spoke five months ago, yeah. it was already very, very negative. And I have even worse news for us. Okay, let's start with that. Let's just get right yeah, into it's it. It's just getting worse and worse every, every, everywhere you look. Well, last time we spoke, we haven't had the energy crisis and uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, with Russia has not escalated to the point where it has now. Let's talk about both these issues. Let's start with energy in Europe. You told me offline this winter is going to be bad. Now, you've lived in Europe. You have a base in Switzerland, you told me. You know, you travel between Dubai and Switzerland. We'll talk about Dubai. But yeah, things are looking bad. How bad? Things are actually quite sad. And I, I live in Europe and it's quite sad what's happening. Um, 2019, something like 10% of Europeans were already in fuel poverty. And this winter, they estimate that something up to 30% of Europeans will be in fuel poverty, meaning people will have to make a choice. Do I feed my kids or do I warm my home? This is not the choice you want to be making if you're trying to look after your family. So things are actually looking pretty sad. And in Europe, uh, sorry, in Switzerland, I'm seeing my neighbors are actually stacking firewood. And I, you know, mentioned a couple of times, took a pictures of that, uh, mentioned a couple of times on, on my social media that I believe that um, stacking firewood now is more profitable than stacking sats. And that's what I would recommend to everyone. Stack gold, stack sats, stack firewood. Quite a, quite a, a sad situ situation to be in in 2022. And bullets, you told me offline. And bullets. Um, not sure how much we can talk about stacking bullets uh, <laughs> online. Well, it is to a broader point about uh, you know social unrest, which is what we're get, going to get there. I mean, the bullets is just one you know uh, one way to interpret it. But let's talk about this energy crisis in a little more detail. But Europeans have other options to provide heating for their homes, do they not? Is it just natural gas? Um, I mean, Europe has pursued um, a really sad policy of um, uh, moving away from nuclear power. Uh, and that policy will bite them in, in their behind. Um, where, where we live in Switzerland, we're quite lucky. Switzerland was quite um, forthcoming with the renewables, but also never banned uh, nuclear power. So villages like mine, we have solar panels. We also have gas, which was, by the way, reduced to a minimum, like the flow was reduced to a minimum. And we also have the nuclear power plants in, in France nearby. So um, if you are in this sort of lucky position and also, you know, living in a village next to a forest, we have fireplaces. So I'm not that worried about, you know, the areas where I live, but I'm very worried about Southern Europe, even in Portugal, um, you need to heat your home and electricity is getting more and more expensive and potentially there'll be no gas. Um, and it's quite a, quite a depressing situation to be in. It is a depressing situation. Can the government help in any way? Can they subsidize? Should they? I mean, the government got us in this problem, right? The government with their subsidies, the government with their agenda, listening to the leftist policies of pursuing um, um, so-called environmentally safe um, energy uh, sources. They got us here to start with. They subsidized and subsidized, and that's where and that's where we are. So I think um, uh, it's like you cannot fight inflation with printing more money yeah. because this is what they're currently doing. And we have almost double-digit inflation in some of the European countries. Like things are really bad. So. I mean, the government's got us here in the first place. How will they get us out of here? That I do not know. So the, so the environmental policies have contributed to this situation. I, I thought it was mainly because Russia just turned off the gas. Well, um, the environmental policies made the Europe so dependent on the oh. Russian gas okay. that uh, now that they turned it off or, you know, there was um, an explosion at the pipeline and we can argue where that explosion came from. 
but they made the entire Europe is so dependent on on, on the Russian gas. Then th this is why we have this mess. Um, Aren't politicians now in Europe using this situation to further pursue the uh, greenification agenda? Now they're saying, well, look at Russia. Look what they're doing with their energy. We have to be self-reliant. And one of the ways we can do that is by using renewable energy resources. Um, look, when you drive through Europe, you see those um, uh, wind farms just standing still. Then you see the uh, dumps of the old wind farms. Um, without claiming to be an, a renewable energy expert, although I did spend 15 years in the oil and gas industry, but I'm not going to be claiming that I'm a renewable energy expert. Yes. But we actually see, you know, just like anecdotally driving by and seeing what's happening. That right. does not see, I mean, the dumps of, um, of uh, turbines um, because you cannot basically recycle that. So they just dump there or the turbines just, just sitting idle. So I do not think that the renewable energy is the answer. Some of the European um, government officials are now bringing up the issue. Why don't we have more nuclear power plants? But they had the, um, the you know, a long standing policy to move away from the nuclear power. And, and now they're trying to say, OK, but the nuclear Nuclear power is the green power, right? You know all this political speak, basically renaming things. Um, it's quite, uh, quite, uh, um, quite sad um, situation. And this winter will be tough, but the next winter will be even tougher. So we just have to wait and see how how the governments will um, approach that. Why would it be tougher you, between this winter and next winter? I mean. 30% of Europeans entering energy poverty, that's already bad enough. But between now and next winter, can we not find an alternative to natural gas to heat our homes? Uh, how many years does it take to bring on um, a substation uh, <laughs> on power? Yes. How many years does it, build, does it take to build a, a nuclear power plant? How many years does it take to explore a new oil field? Um, it takes a lot of years. And so I do not think the problem will be solved by next year. Now the pipelines have been, um, you know, um, compromised. Will the pipeline, will that pipeline ever come online? I don't think so. So, no, I don't think there will be a solution. Okay. And well, how much wood do we have to burn in Europe, right? Uh, that's quite, um, you know, that will end as well. I mean, you told me offline you you live in the Alps where it's close to the forest, so that might, for people living in the city, it's difficult. Um, Tying that into the geopolitical situation in Ukraine and Russia, like you, like you asked, good question. When is that ever going to come online? Well, that depends on a lot of different things. In particular, the outcome of this war, right? Tell us about where you think this war is headed. Um, I'm personally affected by the war. My family is personally affected by this war, like, like almost every other Eastern European family. So this is a, a very painful situation. I've got a lot of friends. I've got a lot of families uh, that... Um, that are suffering. Um, I mean, we see, you know, children and women being bombed. That's just uh, despicable that in 2022 we have this situation. It's absolutely despicable. But also, let's not forget that more than 50 wars is happening right this moment. Yes, the war in Ukraine is the one that most talked about and we must have peace. We must end that. And that uh, is just a despicable situation, however you look at it. Um, but there are more than 50 wars going on at the moment. And this is why I'm such a strong advocate for Bitcoin. And I'll explain why. So imagine um, 400 years ago, you were a king of your country and you had and you decided to invade a, a nearby country, what would you have to do? You'd have to raise taxes, collect gold, silver from your citizens in order to pay the military because military will not go and fight for free, right? They want to feed their kids as well. So you have to raise taxes and then you collect gold and silver from, your, uh, <clears throat> from the citizens of your kingdom and then you go invade another uh, kingdom. 
what government does now, they bring fear to oblivion to fund the uh, military industrial complex. And that's why they can have wars that continue in perpetuity. Look what was happening in Afghanistan. How many years did this war continue? Look what's happening in Iraq. They can fund the wars in perpetuity because of the fiat. Now imagine we're in a Bitcoin standard. Let's imagine that. I know it's a, quite a stretch. And um, a, a president of your country decides to go and uh, invade some other country. They will have to go and ask the citizens of the country, can you contribute your Bitcoin to me? so I can go and uh, invade another country. And the citizens will say, no, thank you very much. We don't want war, we want peace. So they can just refuse. With fiat standard, unfortunately, the governments can just print money without your approval, without my approval, and continue wars in perpetuity, which is quite sad. That's why we need Bitcoin. Bitcoin that's cuts funding for wars is basically... Yes, that's the argument. The government. Gold standard as well. Gold standard cuts uh, funding for wars as well. Because you will, governments have to ask you for your gold in order to fund the war. Gold, Bitcoin, for sure. This is a fair point, Irina, but going back to history, I know you're a student of history. The classical gold standard happened you know, in the late 19th century. There were wars then too, right? Um, that, that's right, and uh, it, they were funded by gold, and there were wars for gold, right? Yeah. So uh, now, um, and there were less people sort of participating in government and the management of the country. How can Bitcoin help, let's say, the Lebanese people, for example? You and I were talking offline about this crisis in Lebanon. People are literally robbing the bank to get their own money. Exactly, exactly. So um, when we talked last time, uh, we were um, discussing how there are some governments out there, including Lebanon, where their currency has failed, literally failed. It's a failed government. They failed their people. And Lebanese are hardworking, very well educated, very smart people, and their government have failed them. So what is happening now is um, the banks, the, the Lebanese people have to rob their banks at a gunpoint to take their money in order to afford, you know, feeding clarify, their children. This is a few isolated cases. Not everybody's doing this, but no, it did no, make, no, no, no. It did yeah. have, It did make the news. Of, yes, course. of course, I'm not yeah. saying everybody's doing yes, that. Of, of course. course, but it did make the news. It did. It did. Yes. And terrible. Um, it's. It, I mean, that's where inept government is taking us. Right. You don't need to look far. Lebanon is just here. You don't need to look far. Europe is just here, what the government of Europe has done to, to their people. And I, I like to say that the answer to this um, stupidity is taking the government representatives to the town squares and, yeah. like in the 17th century, flog them publicly at the town squares. The other thing is owning cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin in particular, you can withdraw your Bitcoin anytime you want, assuming you have access to the internet and your wallet. Not so true if you have cash in a bank that is not allowing you to withdraw, right? But you, but you told me something very interesting. Not all cryptos have this luxury. Ethereum, if you stake it post-merge, which happened last month, you may not be able to get your money back. That's something that not a lot of people are talking about. Tell us about that. So um, what we Bitcoin Maxis um, like to joke about is that the Ethereum proof of stake basically reinvented the fiat but made it even worse because you can't even withdraw your staked ethereum yes. and one of the developers one of the lead developers was actually answering that specific question when can i withdraw my stake ethereum and the answer was that's not even in the roadmap that feature is not even in the roadmap and they will start looking into that in 2024 so i mean that's uh, that's kind of like crazy situation, isn't it? But the thing is, if you look at it, there's not that many validators of Ethereum anyway. They're large institutionals like Coinbase, for example, and they're using uh, Amazon servers based in the US. So this whole Ethereum proof of stake was actually uh, quite a fiasco in my humble opinion. Switching gears, actually, we're gonna talk about another big issue not really financial related, but privacy. Now your privacy, you said to me offline, is important of course, but we're starting to lose privacy because governments are becoming more oppressive all around the world. Where is this trend coming from? Uh, more than 
six billion people in this world live in oppressive, uh, re under oppressive regimes. I mean, there's people in, there are women. Six billion live in, that the majority of the planet live in oppressive regimes. Of course. I mean, I mean just look at what, what's happening. Um, um, there's, uh, um, you know, just next door, Iran, women are fighting to take the veil off. We look in Europe, women are fighting to keep their veil on. Just like, just leave the women alone. That's just one point. Another point is, look what's happening in Eastern Europe, right? Uh, in Russia, hundreds of thousands of, of, of Russian men trying to escape the mobilization. Um, uh, millions of Ukrainians trying to escape the war. I mean, this is just, just complete uh, craziness what's going on. And um, um, Canadian but, government, yes, yeah. for example, Canadian government did an awesome job uh, uh, being uh, one of the oppressive governments. My Australian government did an awesome job being one of the oppressive governments over the last three years. So now I'm thinking those six billion are actually more than six billion because it includes, you know, Canadians and Australians, which I would have never counted us as, as being oppressed. But here we are. And let's look at the privacy, right? Privacy, I think, is a human right. I have curtains in my house, not because I'm trying to do something, uh, uh, something illegal in my house. I have curtains in my house because I deserve to have decency and privacy to, to, to my, to my uh, surroundings. Um, so, for example, Bitcoin um, is not as fungible as people think. You may argue that it's not fungible at all. So we need those privacy uh, features within the Bitcoin protocol to allow for Bitcoin to become fungible. I'm also a big fan of privacy, specific privacy coins, Monero, Zcash. We need privacy as humans, including privacy in our financial transactions. The same with gold. Why people like gold? Why, um, why gold? Why, one of the features that gold bugs talk about is the privacy part of it. I bought it, it's mine, I'll do whatever I want with it. It's off the grid. Okay, going back to your point about, this is why I love talking to you. You're a crypto lawyer. You think philosophically, you think argumentatively. Yes, privacy is a human right, well, I could argue. But I could also argue, Arena, no one's forcing you to use Bitcoin where your whole, whole transactions, history of transactions is being recorded in a ledger. No one's forcing you to use that. You could just use cash, you could use something else, you could just not transact, whatever, right? But if you choose to participate, you have to play the game. Understand that your transactions are being posted on the ledger and everybody can see it. Absolutely, and uh, but also there's always a room for improvement. There's also yeah. uh, always a room to make a system and, better. And also one could argue, if you have nothing to hide, why care? That's another common argument I hear. Well, I'm sure you have nothing to hide, but you have curtains in your house, right? Uh, because I'm sure you would like to keep your... Well, curtains serve a purpose. I don't want people to see me change, right? But when you are not a criminal, when you're just, you know, Irina, you don't need to hide your transactions from the government. That's just one argument. Yes, and, and the and the counter argument to that is like, why government needs to know all of the transactions? Like this morning, I bought some medications for my sore throat. Yes. The medication that I bought for my sore throat is private to me because I have, you know, high blood sugar and it's absolutely my personal business what sort of medication I take. That's just one of the examples. Another example is, you know, when you send your kids to college, uh, you know, you're a public, oh, to, to, to kindergarten, you're a public figure. You do not know what sort of crazies are out there. Uh, you'd want to keep those payments uh, to the kindergarten private so people don't stop you. There's all sorts of uh, security uh, uh, concerns and privacy concerns that people have. And I don't have to explain myself. That's the beauty of it. I don't have to explain my payments to anybody. These are my hard-earned money. I should be able to do whatever I want with it. Final question. Give us a practical application of uh, an infringement of your privacy by the government from a financial standpoint. In other words, how can they use the tools that they currently have an oppressive regime or non-oppressive regime to invade your privacy financially? Um, so uh, let's let's not look far and uh, not far back. Canada and the protests that were happening in Canada. There were people uh, uh, trying to get to work, trying to to earn the living for their kids, to, to feed their families. And then the uh, you know Trudeau government decided, no, we we're gonna we're gonna like smash the protesters. They closed their bank accounts and they you know froze their bank accounts. They traced them. So that is an oppressive regime for me, right? If I can 
financially control you to monitor your speech and if I can financially control you to monitor your thoughts as well because you know the speech starts from thoughts I mean what sort of world are we living in if if this is where the government is taking it very uh, absolutely and also CBDCs you know I always say CBDCs are a horrible horrible idea this is what will happen if the government doesn't like what you think, what you say, what you stand for, uh, even now you and I are talking here, I'm sure there will be some governments that just do not like what you have to say or what I have to think. I'm sensing you don't trust the government, Arena. Um, it's not that I don't trust the government. I, um, I'm, a, uh, I'm old enough to live through the collapse of my own government in the country where I was born where my family had to run for their lives. So it's not that I don't trust. I, you know, I'm a student of history and the history always repeats. Trust but verify is the old adage. Thank you so much for coming to the show, Irina. A pleasure speaking with you. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Kitco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Coin Payments, crypto payments made easy.